Thank you so much for uh, that warm reception. Uh, it's always an honor for me to uh, speak at one of our celebrations of life. I hope that uh, I can give uh, all of you at least a little bit of uh, what, what I get whenever I come and uh, hear someone uh, do the spoken word. Uh, as uh, was just mentioned, um, part of my uh, area of research is uh, non-Western philosophy, and uh, as many of you know, uh, in uh, non-Western culture, particularly in Eastern culture, we, we don't uh, have quite uh, so, so sharp of a division between uh, philosophy and religion, okay, and uh, I find it interesting that uh, uh, among those uh, religious movements that were uh, initially thought of as heretical or uh, heterodox, uh, th there's a lot of sort of uh, similarity between uh, religious movements like ours that, that in, in uh, Western culture were, were thought of as that way. Uh, so as a UU, it's a great source of inspiration to know that our kind of unorthodox religious way of being extends way further into the annals of history than the events uh, involving New England congregationalism in the early 18th century, or the life of Marco uh, Servetus during the Spanish Inquisition, or even the Arian controversy of the early Christian church. Uh, th those of you who have uh, formerly studied UU history know that those are all significant, uh, significant periods uh, for, for UUs for us. And while it is understandably common for us UUs to identify uh, with the agitators in those key periods of Western religious history, uh, spiritual troublemakers, you could say, like Servetus, certainly did not arrive on the human scene only since the birth of Christianity. Uh, they've indeed been with us since there has been religious organization wherever religion has organized. Uh, for me, their presence underscores something uh, truly positive about human nature, specifically in regard to the fearlessness of some, as well as our indomitable drive for reaching better, more fulfilling understandings. Uh, we'll never stop in seeking to quench even the deepest thirst of the soul, regardless of the upheaval or personal sacrifices doing so may bring about. Uh, ultimately, no orthodoxy is capable of caging the inherent quest for deeper meaning humans will always feel. Uh, what's more is that it is undeniable uh, that humanity has benefited as a whole because there have been uh, those, there always have been such people who've been willing to go against the accepted orthodoxies of their time and place and challenge those around them uh, to at the very least produce better systems for people to live under and learn from. To take a more contemporary example, it is clear that the fact that certain leaders of mainline Christian dominations in recent years, uh, that they've become uh, openly accepting of gays marrying, has played a significant role in all of society becoming more accepting and tolerant. Uh, the tendency to shake cages and afflict the comfortable can indeed be noticed cross-culturally throughout humanity. Uh, in the uh, ancient history of India, for instance, the early proponents of Jainism challenge the accepted ritualism and mystic understandings that dominated uh, during uh, what's called the early Vedic period. Uh, like the more famous movement of Buddhism, Jainism is classified among the dissenting or uh, Gnostica traditions that flourished in India for about a thousand years, going all the way back to 600 BC. That Jains rejected such traditions as the, as the orthodoxy of the Vedic text and emphasize a completely individualistic understanding of salvation has been among the key reasons they've been classified among the early Indian religious dissenters. Uh, for us here at First E, it's notable that one commentator takes the latter belief of Jans to mean uh, no part of liberation is assigned to divinity, the soul is on its own. Okay. The affinities such a teaching has with existentialism are, are undeniable. Uh, the central teachings of Buddhism are fairly well known, certainly among American audiences like this one. Uh, Jan thought, however, has been less discussed in the West. Indeed, even for those Westerners who can be thought of as knowledgeable of world religions, 
the extent of their familiarity of Jainism seems to go no further than the extreme steps Jains take to avoid harming any living beings. And that's a topic worthy of another uh, Sunday celebration of life. For, for these reasons, I would like to focus specifically on some distinctive aspects of Jain thought that I see as especially compatible with UU principles. Uh, I found that consideration of these key features of Jainism has been helpful to me in better elucida elucidating some of the ideas that have always attracted me to Unitarian Universalism. Consider the traditional Jan teaching regarding the manyness of reality, or antiki vata, as it's called, and how it relates to Jainism's askewal of dogma. As you use our take our faith to call us to never stop trying to be more tolerant and accepting, I've thus found the way reality is discussed in the early Jan tradition to be greatly illuminating as well as helpful in my efforts to better uphold UU principles. Okay. In the Jan tradition, reality is described via the concept of Saya Devada, uh, which is translated in English roughly to mean the doctrine of maybe. Okay. According to this concept, uh, reality for us embodied creatures is extremely indeterminate in its nature such that the universe allows for many points of view, each of these yield a unique and different conclusion. Uh, no one point of view, however, can completely express the nature of reality, even though the richness of the universe admits of never-ending and seemingly contrary descriptions that can all be regarded as correct. In discussing the Jan view of knowledge, philosopher Forrest Bard writes, uh, our ordinary knowledge is necessarily incomplete, since it is obtained from one of many perspectives, each perspective addressing only one of many aspects of an object or situation. As you use and as existentialist, we can surely feel an affinity with the insight that reality is too complex and multifaceted to fit neatly into any of our simple descriptions. What's more is that keeping this kind of insight in mind can be helpful for those of us who never stop trying to be more accepting of others. This point was underscored by Mahatma Gandhi, who famously incorporated Jainism in his works and teachings. Uh, Gandhi stated, it has been my experience that I'm always true from my point of view, and I'm often wrong from the point of view of my honest critics. I know that we are both right from our respective points of view. And this knowledge saves me from attributing motives to my opponents or critics. I very much like this doctrine of the manyness of reality. It is this doctrine that has taught me to judge a Muslim from his standpoint and a Christian from his. Jainism holds that instead of thinking that some views like our own are just right and others are therefore necessarily wrong, it's more accurate to think that all views, even those with which we disagree, are ultimately partial expressions of the truth. Is my understanding the famous blind men and the uh, elephant parable originated with the early Jan attempts to explain this position. The parable was used to convey the Jan unease with dogmatically defining how things are. Every true statement on this view can really only be thought of as conditionally correct given the point of view from which the statement is asserted. According to Jainism, our ordinary everyday perceptions will inevitably be incomplete given that they always result from just one of many possible points of view that are all based on just a single aspect of a vast and multifaceted reality. Ultimately then, Jainism implores us to remember that when we become unjustifiably confident about our limited perspectives, trouble will surely ensue. Uh, the doctrine of Asaya Devada, uh, which is also understood to mean in some respect, gave the Jans a way to take a middle position between the more extreme views uh, of other uh, philosophical systems in ancient India uh, that claimed either that reality is ultimately fixed and unchanging or that there exists nothing permanent and everything is in a constant state of change. Uh, philosopher Roy Perot notes, uh, Ankit Devada implies that while the Jan view of reality is authoritative, rival philosophical doctrines are only wrong on account of their one-sidedness. Uh, what is particularly distinctive about the Jan point of view here is not only does it deny that only one view or the other must be correct, 
But it also says that it is wrong to claim that neither view is right, or even that both views are right. Okay, in the words of one noted scholar of Eastern philosophy, the Jans think reality is too complex in its structure, that, or so rather complex in its structure, that while every one of these views is true as far as it goes, none is completely so. Its precise nature baffles all attempts to describe it directly and once and for all, but it's not impossible um, to make it known through a series of partially true statements without committing ourselves to any one of them exclusively. Thus, reality is enunciated via the sevenfold formula. One, maybe something is. Two, maybe something is not. Three, maybe something is and is not. Four, maybe something is inexpressible. Five, maybe something is and is is inexpressible, six, maybe something is not and is inexpressible, and seven, maybe something is, is not, and is inexpressible, okay? Accordingly, Jainism holds that when speaking of something, it is necessary to indicate what we're talking about in relation to categories like time, place, and state. As you use, it is of course natural for us to be leery of and to eschew dogma, uh, I found in the Jan tradition a guide by which to seek insight and gain understanding that does not involve uh, any serious dogmatic commitments. Let us consider the Jan doctrine of antic divada in relation to commonly noticed conflicts within present day societies. Underlying so many of these conflicts are disagreements over what our guiding principles as a society should be. Uh, we should keep in mind, though, that when dealing with everyday situations, there never exists just one relevant principle that, can, that we can be so sure of that it makes sense to believe it should be absolutely adhered to, no matter what. Letting go of trying to find such a principle can help us better manage our conflicts. Okay, take, for example, the long-standing disagreements our country has had about increasing taxes. Okay, underlying the positions of one side are beliefs about everyone paying their fair share, as well as the importance of society maintaining strong safety nets. Those opposed to such beliefs are typically animated by their own views regarding individual freedoms, allowing people to keep whatever they earn. Disagreements over taxation in our country, it seems, can thus largely be boiled down to differences over whether everyone should do their part to ensure all have what they need, or whether it is better for a society to let individuals decide for themselves what social objectives, the money they earn, will support. I think we can all readily agree that both ideas are at least sometimes correct. Applying traditional Jan understandings to disagreements about taxation can therefore be illuminating. First, the Jan view would say that it is a mistake to think that any one guiding principle absolutely captures what is true and should therefore always be followed no matter the situation before us. Thus, this view cautions us against thinking that one position or the other is right on taxation because it is based on an absolute, complete, and infallible understanding of what's true. We're instead implored by Jainism to consider the particular place we currently occupy uh, in a society within a broader, ever-changing, and dynamic context so as to find out what the correct principles are for us right now. What's more is that I feel implored by Jan philosophy to avoid dismissing out of hand views that I find disagreeable and to instead focus on the much harder work of trying to understand the ways in which these views get it right. This kind of effort is, after all, what is in line with the Jan depiction of our grasp of reality. We should remember that according to the Jan perspective, both the view which holds everyone should do their part to ensure the well-being of all, and the one that says people should be allowed to decide for themselves how their money should be spent, can be regarded as partially correct, yet given the limitations we face in knowing truth, we cannot hold steadfast and dogmatically to either view as if it is correct in all situations we find ourselves in when deciding which action to take regarding tax policy. This follows since we cannot think of any view as being correct independently of when, where, and how we currently exist. Thus, re resolving questions before us uh, largely involves, involves humbly seeking to understand the broader context 
we happen to be inhabiting at a given time. Doing so will help us to get some clear sense of which principle it would be most appropriate, uh, most appropriate for us to follow for the time being in dealing with the given issue before us. We can indeed think of this broader context as an elephant before us that we're all forced to understand in spite of our very well and obvious limitations. We can thus see that on a Jan understanding, it makes sense to think of our guiding principles as being akin to medical supplies a doctor has available to her as she goes about treating a patient. Given the particular symptoms as well as the history of this patient, some methods of treatment would clearly be more appropriate to apply in a given situation than others, even though it would make no sense to say that uh, there is one correct treatment regimen for all medical practitioners to prescribe in every situation in which there is illness. After all, some treatments that would clearly be beneficial in some situations would be positively harmful in others. Interestingly, this is the case, even though it is clear that some treatments are effective in given circumstances, and some would stretch the limits of credulity to apply no matter what a patient's condition might be. The Jan tradition offers an alternative to the all too commonly held notion that only one view can be right on a given issue, and the right view must necessarily rule out any other views. The unsavory effects of, under, of humans uh, subscribing to this notion have been all too real in our world. One need only look around and see the typically disheartening results produced by the either we are right or they are right mindset. By thinking in this way, humans have been reluctant to seek common ground, apparently believing that to do so is denigrating to one's own understanding of how things are. The doctrine of Asai Devada indicates a way out of this predicament. This doctrine ultimately says that like the blind men touching the elephant, when humans are disagreeing with each other, it is ultimately a matter of different individuals offering partial yet largely correct descriptions of what they perceive. This is the case even when these descriptions seemingly contradict one another. There is a problem, though. This understanding uh, seems to indicate that even those who are promoting uh, what strike me as clearly false and harmful views, okay, like those who uh, say all medical treatment should be shunned or, or climate change is a myth, uh, we, we should still think of them as being in some important way correct. Okay, this seems to present a problem for, for the Jan view of reality. Uh, if, however, we consider two points that are in line with how Jans understand truth, this problem, which is a variation of the commonly wrestled with uh, problem, does tolerance mean we tolerate evil, uh, does not seem so serious. First, we can say without contradicting the Jan notion, the many-sidedness of truth, that in some significant sense, the view which says it makes sense to enforce a correct understanding of what we see to be true by saying, uh, requiring everyone to pay taxes, for instance, is right. Okay, when we're enforcing such an understanding, though, we should do so while humbly acknowledging the limits of our knowledge as we seek to gain better insight of the broader, overall complex context we inhabit at any given point in time. Okay, when having to decide on a course of action in the midst of divergent points of view recommending what should be done, Jainism implores us to remember that not only is everyone's understanding limited, but that everyone's understanding is partially correct. Thus, the challenge becomes figuring out the perspectives from which different opinions are correct and deciding what we can say is the most appropriate perspective right now to approach the given matter from. All the while, we should remember that others, for whatever reason, are approaching the same matter from a perspective that seems most appropriate to them and from which their opinion is correct. Ultimately, Jan philosophy tells us that when we're disagreeing with someone, the real issue between us is settling on a shared, broader perspective from which you approach a matter. When thinking about disagreements in this way, I'm more likely to think in terms of another's shared humanity instead of what arguments are the most logically compelling, as I find myself more likely to think beyond our nature as rational creatures. What's more is that this kind of thinking moves me away from trying to achieve a victory over those I disagree with and more towards a mindset 
that seeks to find a mutually shared understanding. Though thinking in this way does not make my differences with another disappear, I found it does, more than any alternatives I'm aware of, tend to lead to more fruitful and productive interactions with those who think differently from me. Additionally, in regard to my disagreements with others, adopting a Jan-like mindset enables me to think in terms of what I'm willing to endure to advance the beliefs which I take to be true, and which I acknowledge are wrong from perspectives different than mine. This is notably different from thinking in terms of how I can get others to do what is correct from the perspective I take to be the right one on a given matter. By focusing primarily on how much I'm willing to go through for what seems correct to me, I'm less likely to waste time engaging in futile attempts to change how others think and act, matters that will ultimately always remain beyond my control. Furthermore, this kind of focus helps me uh, feel a real degree of inner peace that comes from knowing if I'm indeed wrong about the perspective with which I'm approaching a given matter, I'm at least doing something to keep others from suffering for a mistake that I've made. I'm thus better able to practice the acceptance and inclusion that the UU faith emphasizes. These points lead to another one that I have in mind uh, regarding the problems of accepting views that I find to be obviously false. It seems that the true problem with people holding such views lies not so much with the views themselves, but with the degree of certainty they assume to possess regarding those views. Thus, a climate change skeptic, for example, uh, cannot consider the cost for humanity if he's wrong. Even though it is clear that such an individual is adhering at some level to a principle that is correct he is overly certain of the principle and the appropriateness of applying only that principle to the given circumstances. He is also showing a lack of concern for the real possibility that his view is wrong. Thus, the skeptic is actually proceeding in a way that can rightly be considered non-Jan-like, and that is where the real problem lies. As Pere indicates, they are wrong about or they are wrong on account of their one-sided. I must remember, though, that the skeptic is right from his perspective, and getting him to change that perspective is, if not totally beyond my control, then a much more complicated matter th than is usually assumed. Okay, remembering these kinds of things can help me focus on that which I've actually found to be most effective in navigating my disagreements with others, like trying to set the best example that I can. As a Unitarian Universalist, I understand our faith tradition to call on me to be not just more tolerant, but also accepting of all others. For me, this means that I should both celebrate and try to learn from diverse points of view. Jan teachings about the nature of reality and how we should think of truth uh, give me resourceful insights by which I can better do all of that. I find such teachings, in other words, to be helpful in my quest to become a better Unitarian Universalist. Okay, so thank you. That's <laughs>